Um, hi all. Um, I'm Remus Dean. I'm a sixth year in Cork Life Centre. Um, been here for about a year and a half, two years. Um, and welcome to the third event of Edmund Rice Week. Um, very special because it's marking the 20th um, year of Cork Life Centre. So yay. <laughs> um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, particular special guests, um, Dr. Sharon Lambert, James Leonard and Peter, um, Father Peter McFerry. Um, and of course our own Dom and Rachel. Um, we're going to be spending this session talking about advocacy. Um, each of our guests will be sharing some thoughts and their own insights and what then there'll be a panel discussion, um, but you can be sent, sending in your own questions and whatever throughout um, in the little Q&A thing at the bottom. Um, uh, Don's gonna open with a couple of words, so. Um... Thanks, Remus. Um, you know, it, this, this year is special to us, it's 20th anniversary, and it's, it's, it's a celebration not of a centre existing, but of the young people and the volunteer staff that have come through the doors to Cork Life Centre. Um, staff are, are nearly over a thousand now at this stage, and, and young people um, are, are near enough to that too now. And when we sit to, to do this, we do this conference every year, we've done it for years. Um, the great thing about this year's one is that it was supposed to happen last year and everybody that's on the panels this week had given uh, the okay to be to be with us last year and then COVID struck and we turned around and went back to everyone uh, this year and asked every single person who was willing to come in and I suppose for me that's a testament to the young people in the centre because many of them will have met the young people um, and being blown away like we as staff are all the time. And the great thing for me is that um, this is about this week is about children and children's rights. And home, like I'm looking at Father Peter McVerry there in homelessness. And, and sometimes, you know, we think things have got better and they've got worse. And it, 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 it's neglected and children at the heart of that. And we expect children to be able to organize themselves and come into school from homeless, homelessness situations. And we do that across a wide range of issues. The other great thing for me is that, you know, there's three people on the panel that I totally admire um, and their way of being and their ethos will be very close to what the life centers is. And for the people that are here, they're friends. Uh, first and foremost for me, they're friends. And the whole week has been like that. Uh, and that's just, it, it is, it's just a, an amazing thing to share with friends at special occasions. Um, so, so I'm so glad to have Dr. Sharon Lambert, Father Peter McNary, and James Leonard uh, it, it, on the panel today. To me, it's a perfect panel. Um, I want to thank Remus for, for, for chairing uh, and I'm going to chair the whole thing through. Um, and we've done that this week for all, uh, every chair has been one of the three so thank you. Um, you know, I hope you can, and I know you'll be able to take things away from here. Mm. But what I'd like you to do is if you have questions, do put them in early so that we see them coming in uh, and we can get around to answering them uh, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Um, we're going to be starting our conversation now. It's mostly going to be guided by a couple of questions, but guided. Just loose guidelines, basically. Um, the question would be, uh, building services and policies and the voices that matter most, what works and what doesn't, and what's the future? Um, it's We're going to be starting off um, with Father Peter McVerry. Um, again, thank you for being here. Um, would you like to share your thoughts on the question? And anything else? Yes, of course, and thank you very much indeed. Uh, I've been working with homeless young people now for a long time. <clears throat> And originally, when I started, I came across young people, 12, 13, 14, sleeping on the street. 
And I naively thought all I had to do was to go to the health board and tell them what was happening and that they would welcome me with open arms <laughs> and they would say, what can we do to help? <laughs> So I proposed opening a hostel for some of those young people, get them off the streets. And I went to the health board. They didn't want to know. They said they didn't agree with the hostel. They didn't see the point of the hostel. They weren't going to fund the hostel. Uh, and they said, uh, I said, these kids aren't being cared for. And the response was, but they're not going to school. So they'll be prosecuted and they'll be sent to a children's detention center. And there they'll be cared for. I couldn't believe it. Naively, I thought all you had to do was present the problem and people would rush to try and, and address the problem. Eventually, we got our money. But why did we get our money? We got our money because the, the inner city was beginning to explode. There was a lot of car robbing, a lot of joy riding, a lot of handbag snatching. And every evening in the evening papers, uh, you'd have the latest exploits of the kids in the inner city. And the government's response was to open Lock and House in County Cavan as a juvenile prison for 12 to 16 year olds from the inner city. And there was an outcry from the agent, all the childcare agencies, that if this is your only response to deprived kids in the inner city, lock them up 200 miles away. And so and our proposal to open a little hostel, they jumped at it purely, purely to avoid the political fallout of opening, opening Lock and House. And that was a great uh, uh, eye opener for me, presenting the facts, prevent, presenting the data and presenting the need doesn't actually get results. And I'll come to another story at the end. Uh, <clears throat> but my image is, imagine the owner of a house. Why, why doesn't it get results? Imagine the, uh, the owner of a house who lives on the top floor and he has a tenant living in the basement. And at eight o'clock in the morning, he pulls back the curtains, sun shines in, he looks out into the beautiful garden and the multicolored flowers and the birds looking for the worms. And he says, isn't it a beautiful day? But his tenant in the basement uh, of the house pulls back the curtains at eight o'clock on the same morning, looks out into the back garden, and all they see is the outside wall of the back toilet. They can't see the garden or the flowers or the birds or anything. And so the tenants go to the owner and they say, eh, we would like if you would remove the toilet. And then we'd have a much better quality of life. We'd have a lovely view of the garden and we'd be able to access the garden. And the owner would say, and this is, this is my, uh, my, my line, the, when you present things to, uh, to government, the response often is, what you don't understand is. And so the answer to the tenant is, what you don't understand is, there are people enjoying this garden on a lovely sunny day and they need the outside toilet. And what you don't understand is that it's gonna be very expensive to take that toilet away. Where are you gonna get the, where are we gonna get the money? And what you don't understand is that that outside toilet adds value to my house. When I come to sell it, I'll get more money for it. And so there we have two totally different views, what I call the view from the top and the view from the bottom. And those who make the decisions in our society all have the view from the top. They are all in well-paid, pensionable jobs. They are all living in nice houses, in nice areas of town. Their children are going to third level and they have no idea or only a purely theoretical idea of how the people in the in the basement are living. And so there's a complete divergence of viewpoint. And so when you present the, uh, the, the perspective of the tenants in the basement, it's met with incredulity. They're, they're coming from they're living in a different world and they don't understand or appreciate uh, what you're, you're saying. Now, many decision makers are good, caring people. And why don't they listen to what you present? Well, you might have a very good, caring civil servant who really wants to do what you're asking, but he has to persuade his superior, and he has to persuade his superior, and he has to persuade a, a government minister, and the government minister has to persuade the cabinet, and the cabinet have to persuade the Taoiseach. And so it's like trying to turn a whole ship around. 
Uh, a good caring person may find obstacle after obstacle after obstacle placed in their path, uh, not out of uncaringness, but simply because the issue is uh, uh, requires the coordination and cooperation of so many different people. Second story I want to use was a <clears throat> one that happened a long time ago, but uh, again illustrates the the issue for me. There was a court case in which a man, a father, was being prosecuted for the most horrendous physical and sexual abuse of his daughter. And the case went through the courts for a week and the papers detailed the horrendous abuse day after day. And finally on the Friday, the father was convicted. Now, a social worker rang me up over the weekend and said, do you know that that girl who's now 16 is sleeping on the streets? And she said, I can't say anything or I lose my job. So I said, I will. <laughs> so I got onto the Irish Times. The next, on Monday morning, front page headline story, this girl who had suffered so much was sleeping on the street. Now that generated enormous response. That girl was given accommodation and support within 24 hours. The Minister for Health at the time was on television and radio for a whole week, trying to explain that this system has failed this girl and they have to ensure that the system would not uh, would not fail anybody else. It got huge reaction. And so for me, the, the way you get change is you have, to, uh, you have to create outrage, outrage at the current situation. And therefore you have to use the media. You have to use the media to create that outrage. We had an example today where the big investment funds have been shown to be buying up whole estates of houses. Uh, and therefore preventing those estates from being available to people who want to buy their own home. Now the government are very conscious. <laughs> they are very, very conscious that uh, housing is a major issue for the next election. And now while I and others have been calling for years for those vulture funds and cuckoo funds to be regulated and getting absolutely nowhere, today's revelation in the paper that they had bought up a whole housing estate in County Kildare has made the government, the ministers have been on the radio and television today saying that they're going to regulate the, uh, the, the, the housing, uh, the, these big international investment funds. So for me, the issue is how do you change people's hearts? You can appeal to their head, doesn't get you anywhere. You can give them the statistics and the facts and the need, but unless you appeal to their heart, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to get change. And appealing to the heart means making it more difficult for them not to do what you want than to do what you want. And that means embarrassing them, creating outrage using the media. And the danger of that is that there will be, there will be blowback. Those who are, those vested interests, those who don't want change will come back and will attack you. And I've been, I've been called naive. I've been called an attention seeker, publicity seeker, trying to make a name for myself. I've been called all sorts of things by those who don't want the changes that, uh, that I might be, might be advocating, but that's the price you pay. And you just have to be determined and committed and go ahead with, uh, with, with what you believe. So for me, it's the, the response is going to be, but what you don't understand is, that's the resistance. And it's coming from a totally different perspective. And you have to put that pressure on them that if you don't do what we're asking, things will be more uncomfortable for you than doing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really, really, really agree on so many levels. Um, I tend to work in climate activism myself and the amount of times I've talked to politicians and the look of just, well, that's very nice, but here's why. The only reason, like the only way to get anywhere with them is to convince them that not doing what you say is an idiotic decision for their career, not appealing to anything else is, which is ridiculous, but how it is, I suppose. Thank you again very much.
Um, I'd like to remind people that you can constantly send in questions in the Q&A um, so that we can see them and so that they're there for the entire time. Um, and I'd like to introduce again, Dr. Sharon Lambert and ask her for her opinions on the question. Um, thanks, Remus. I suppose a lot of what I have to say echoes what P Father Peter McFerry has said. So I grew up in a council estate and uh, when I was young, I was too very naive. And I always, I suppose I was aware, very aware and very conscious of a lot of difficulties that people have, you know, particularly if you don't have any money and it's very difficult to access things that you need. So I thought it's as simple as, you know, you go to university and you get a qualification and then you can you can go out and you can make change. Now, of course, if you you come from from a, a low income uh, background or a working class background, it's not as simple as that. There's lots of barriers to getting into education. So I couldn't go to university until I was a mature student. Um, and even when you do that, then there are still barriers. And some of those barriers are external barriers, but some of them are also internal barriers. So how you feel about yourself and whether you feel like you fit in and whether you feel like you're in the right place. So for me, when I've been engaged in, in advocacy, you know, one of the things is that you're made to feel like you don't understand. And if you have that internal barrier where you might feel like that you're not good enough or your face doesn't fit, then that can reinforce it. Um, I've been watching um, politics a lot. Actually, I, I was never very political up until the last 12 months because I suppose the naivety has finally worn off in my 45th year that, at, that it, 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 the, the sitting around the table, which I did a lot for a very long time, hasn't really worked. Um, so I think what has to happen is that you have to be angry. Um, I am a psychologist now. I have worked with young people in the community. I now work in academia and my research is in mental health, addiction and homelessness. I think it's unethical for me as a psychologist and a researcher to collect data from groups who have no voice if I only use that voice for research purposes. I have to now get angry about the fact that I have collected lots of data. I have presented that data in different places. And people are very polite and they're very nice and they say that's amazing and you're great and your research is fabulous. But then it rarely translates into policy change. And like, um, Father McFerry said there, you know, the outrage that has happened in the last 48 hours in relation to, to housing, you know, we've seen that unfold in, in social media. And that has worked. It has made a difference. Um, one of the things that I think when you're a young person, when you're involved in advocacy, is that you are very patronized. So they'll tell you that you don't really understand. You couldn't possibly understand because you're a young person. Um, and what they often say is you've oversimplified the issue. So I think you should turn that back on them because they've actually oversimplified the issue. And they have, haven't actually thought about all the possible different strands. Um, so I think if I ever go to a meeting again where I'm presenting data in relation to people who are experiencing um, addiction, mental health and homelessness, and somebody tells me that it's, it's oversimplified, I'll say, no, actually, you've, you've oversimplified it because you have a very narrow lens and it's coming from your perspective. Um, so I suppose... My main thing that I want to say is I absolutely agree with Father Peter McFerry. I suppose I think that you have to make noise. I think you have to be be angry. Um, and, and yes, there is a blowback. Um, you know, I, I have gotten messages from, from people when I have been very vocal in relation to government policy, particularly in relation to housing and in relation to mental health services. I do get, it means that sometimes I actually get excluded. I, meetings that I used to be invited to before, I don't get invited to now because I have said something in public or I've put something up on social media that criticizes the policy. Um, but I, I've had to make that choice because, you know, can I ethically continue to sit around tables and continue to produce research and continue to collect data when I know that it's actually not landing? Um, so something has to change. Um, and in relation to, to the work that the young people have done in the Life Centre, particularly in relation to the campaigning that you've done for climate change, I have two little girls and my, my eldest child is only 10 and she's really passionate about um, the climate. And I remember she, she, she went out picking up rubbish on the road one day and she, was, she 
we live in a rural area and she spent you know two hours picking up coffee cups and all that kind of stuff and she came in and she was so proud and so delighted because she was saving the planet and then two days later she went out and all the stuff was back again you know and she came in and she she started to cry and she said to me it's not working because the grown-ups aren't listening and I drove her into Cork City where there were students from the life center and um, picketing outside city hall every Friday making loads of noise and I said this is this is what's happening young people are making a change and just because old people like me aren't get, getting things fast enough I am absolutely convinced I have never seen a more socially aware generation or a more climate justice aware generation than the one that exists now. So I'm angry, I'm really angry about lots of social injustice, um, but I'm also very, very hopeful because uh, I genuinely have never seen the level of of compassion and understanding that exists um, within young people today. Um, so not to be putting up too much pressure on your shoulders, but I actually, I do have great hope. And one of the things I want to finish on, so for me in relation to the advocacy work that I do, and because I come from a working class background, that feeling you can get sometimes when you go into different places and spaces where people are not like you, or you know that they've had different experiences or they've, you know, James will probably talk about social capital, and um, you know, the things, so you have to fight a bit harder to get your foot in the door. And then when you get in the door, there will be attempts. They're very subtle attempts to try and undermine you. Um, but you can be in charge and you can be in control of your internal barriers. Find your tribe, uh, get support from your tribe. When somebody tries to push you back and tell you that you've oversimplified an issue or that you don't understand, yeah, it can damage your self-esteem and you feel like you want to retreat, but stick to your tribe and support each other and keep pushing things forward. And I genuinely, I genuinely think, absolutely convinced that we're on the cusp of change. I think when COVID is over, I think a lot of people are going to take to the streets. I have personally polished up my marching boots and I'm ready to go. So um, thank you, you know, very much for having the opportunity to be here today. I'm just uh, absolutely delighted. And uh, it's just very hard to follow Father Peter McFerry when you're always standing him, you know? So thanks a million. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 the, the story about your daughter is the cutest thing. <laughs> it's adorable. Um, I, on many, many levels, again, I agree. Um, I just, I personally, I think I'm still in the naivety mindset of just why can't you just change? People are hurting. Why can't you fix it? Which I think in some levels, you need to grow out of it a bit to be able to come up with those ideas and to be able to point them but at the same time you can't grow out of that naivety to a degree because you need to still have the mindset to say no just change it I don't care how hard it is people are hurting change it fix it and thank you again very much um again reminding people Q&A very much there please do use it <laughs> thank you um and now we have James Leonard. Good luck following all of those. You will probably manage, no problem. <laughs> I'd be grand, I'd be grand. Can we all agree actually that Remus Teen is the best name ever? You know? <laughs> so well done on your parents for giving you an amazing name. Um, and it's an absolute honor to follow up for Peter McFurry and Dr. Sean Lambert, two people that I would admire and look up to. Um, and it's an honour to be asked by Dan and Rachel as well to um, give my thoughts here. When I talk in terms of advocacy, I agree with what the lads were saying there around research not being enough. You have to kind of you have to mobilise. You have to become active. Um, and I think the use of media, in my experience, the use of multimedia has had way more impact um, than I would have initially thought. Like I did a, a bachelor's degree in community work. I did a master's in criminology and doing a PhD. So I'm involved in kind of research, you know. And uh, I always, I suppose, naively enough felt that if you have good quality research that you could stand over, it can't be ignored, you know, but it can be ignored and it's always ignored. And I found that, like, when I was going through my master's, I was doing it on drug policy. And around that time, 
there was a review. The government had a working group that where they got in uh, some of the best researchers in, in the world around the, the field of drug policy. Um, people that I would have uh, referenced to that and looked up to, they were brought in. They did a piece of research. They came back to the government with recommendations on drug policy and the government ignored it and did what they wanted to do anyway. And I felt like, what's, what's the actual point in getting a working group and not taking the recommendations, you know? And like like what Peter was saying, there was excuses of, oh, well, we can't implement decriminalization because we have a different culture to Portugal and you know, we're not the Netherlands either, it's not Amsterdam, you know, all these excuses. So after that, you're thinking like, oh, I was losing heart with the research side of things, you know. Um, around this time, I was asked to go on the Tommy Turner show. I seen you on it recently, Peter. You did brilliant, by the way. But um, when I went on the Tommy Turner show, the impact that that had was unbelievable. It was overwhelming, and it just showed me it wasn't the research that was going to change things. It was going to be hearts and minds, like what we spoke about, putting the face to the figures, the statistics, and the policy, and all this stuff, you know. It's back to this thing, nothing about us without us, giving the people um, a say in policies that affect them. You know, um, like if you had to, like for, for my own story, for people that might not know, I'm from the north side where I'm living right here, you know, a working class area. I had a very bad experience in secondary school. Um, the, the life centre wasn't around when I was in secondary school, so I'm showing my age there a small bit, but I so wish it was. I wish it was because I had a very tough time in secondary school. I shouldn't have been in there really. Um, I, I, I was a very troubled young fella at the time. And uh, through my time down with the Life Centre on placements and um, and volunteering, I just see the level of care given to the young people. Um, and that's what I needed. But at that, like, I was a vulnerable. Looking back now, you know, with my professional, academic and adult hat on, I was a very vulnerable young person, you know. But I was uh, labelled as a scot, a tug, uh, disruptive out of the class that type of thing you know so it was always a negative attention so when I come into late teens and started experimenting with drugs the teachers just turned into the guards but it was the same it was the same thing you know it was always negative um, and I'd have loved to have went through um, the life centre you know because you know you're, you're not judged you're not labelled there's a more of an understanding as to why people like let's say if I was in the life centre you say clearly James is a bright boy he was always bright in school you know clearly James is a bright boy but for whatever reason he can't sit still or for whatever reason he can't concentrate well, I wonder what's going on there let's go down and ask that's what I that's the care I would get in the life centre today that's the care I didn't get back then you know um, and in terms of my own advocacy then I have a podcast called the Tone Ari's Podcast after the Tommy Turner show, I had a realization that using multimedia is a huge, it's a huge opportunity to put a face to the stories, you know, a face to the statistics, like what we said. And like Dan in, and Rachel in the Life Center, my wife works in uh, Ute Reach, um, which would have a kind of a similar uh, group of young people, you know. Um, and we understand that young people that have trouble or difficulty in school, they are vulnerable young people and they come from, you know, a lot of difficulty. Um, sometimes they use drugs to cope with those difficulties. You know, it's like in lieu of um, adult coping skills or coping skills I developed in my late twenties and early thirties in recovery. I didn't have the coping skills. I couldn't regulate all these negative emotions. I used substances. You know, um, and for young people that use substances, let's say if you have somebody that's been through care or abuse and they're using substances. 15, 16, you're going to understand it. You're going to say, it's no wonder, look, this is what they're doing, this is what they've been through. You can see that they're vulnerable. Um, and, you know, when that young person turns from 17 to 18, all of a sudden the sympathy goes out the window. They're an adult now. Let's put them into the hostel. Let's put them into prison. That, you know, that coping skill he used when he was 17, when he was in the life center, 16 in the life center. Now he's 18. He's still that vulnerable young person. He's the exact same person. He's the exact same young fella. Now he's in the Simon, you know, and I know he's going to court for doing the same thing he did. They don't become adults overnight. I don't become a, a totally like a, a vulnerable 17 year old doesn't turn into a criminal man overnight, you know. And I think we have to judge, look at people in the homeless hostels, like people that Peter McFurry would have worked at, um, people in Simon where I worked. Um, you have to look at them with the same compassion you would have looked at them when they were 12 and 13. You, know, you have to have a, an understanding as to why people end up on the street, why people end up 
using intravenously in spite of all the negative consequences that come with that you know what leads what happens in somebody's life that they'll use drugs till they kill themselves you know and that's what happens um so with the podcast we bring people on to give their story and it has a big impact you know people uh, commenting and messaging us saying that you know, they're looking at people now with a different light. They have more of an awareness around addiction, mental health. They have more of an awareness around social issues. Um, we recently got access into the prison. So the podcast has been streamed in around all the Irish prisons. They have a prison TV channel, which is a, a legacy of COVID. You know, they, they, in, in the prisons, they have, uh, they're all on an internet network. You now they have video calls and, and what have you. So they have a prison TV channel. But that's a great audience for us, you know. Um, because when you're in a prison like that, in general, for, like I can only get my experience, from my experience, prison was almost respite from the harsh reality of street life and addiction. And when I was in prison, I was in a much better place physically, emotionally, psychologically. And when you're in a place like that, you're more receptive to learning, you're more receptive to new ideas. And I think that if the podcast, like I've, I've had Sharon on the podcast, I've had Dan, Peter said he'd come on and I'd hold him to that. Um, we've had people on the podcast like myself. I'm not in special. I was just given a platform on RT, and now I try to give others a platform because there's loads of people like me. You know, when you're born into a community like where I'm from, Knocknaheen in Halley Hill, um, we're not all uh, scumbags or junkies or knackers, and these are the terms that would be used to describe us. You know, and if you look in Cork Prison, um, predominantly made up of men from my area, from traveller men. And certain areas on the south side, we're not all born criminals. You know, there's certain societal structures at play that limit our options and channel us down certain routes, you know. And Sharon said I was going to talk on uh, social capital, so now I have to talk about social capital. <laughs> but people don't, don't understand that people, like, let's, I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but people that aren't interested in this field or aren't from the areas where we work or know the people that we work with, they might find it very hard to understand, oh, why can't James just go to university and get a job like everybody else? Why can't Sharon just go to university and get a job like everybody else? There's no psychologists in my estate. There is no doctors. There is no lawyers. There is no teachers. That's it, you know, and... Uh, when you're like we've a high uh, rate of lone parents, we've a high Cork North Lee HSE district, the highest rates of benzo diazepine prescribing in the whole country, a medicalization of poverty, treat the poverty and the social exclusion with a tablet, you know, and people don't understand the obstacles that the young people that Dan and Rachel work with, the young people that Peter and Sharon have worked with, and that I see on a regular, you know, they come through so many obstacles, and for them if they can manage to stop cutting themselves, stop using drugs, stop offending, that's amazing. Do you know, it takes so much effort around here for a mother or a father to get the child to do the leaving sort. It just takes so much effort. So damn you if you look over here and you think, why can't they all go to college and get a job like the rest of us? Because you just need to open your eyes a little bit. So look, it was an honor to talk here and um, thanks again. Thank you very, very much. Um, Honestly, as someone who barely did his junior cert, I dropped out of school just beforehand, managed to force myself in. Can't imagine, like, without the Life Centre or help of some extent or some sort of support that I have been given, that I would be doing my leaving this year. I, like, getting in to do my junior cert is my proudest achievement in my life. Um, I was at my worst. But I still did it, and well done, you. Well I, done. I can't. I can't imagine anyone struggling with addiction or or any form of psychological issues as I was would find that any more easy. Particularly when it comes to leaving, cert, no matter how important it is, there's it's incredibly difficult to do that when you have other things going on in your life. Um, and I very much agreed with the points on children with difficulties and drug addictions being viewed as evil because no child is evil that honestly no no one is born evil no child is evil no drug user is evil the very very few people who turn to drugs or turn to some form of substance substance abuse are bad people the vast majority do not do it for fun or for enjoyment they do it as an 
ex escape and I can't imagine that would be I can't imagine anyone do, going to those extremes to any for any other reason than an escape um which is something that's not very talked about and it's incredibly disappointing um but again thank you very much and thank you to all of our speakers um <laughs> and I would like to invite Don to say a couple of words here and after that we're going to have the discussion which is yay <laughs> I suppose, you know, when you look at advocacy, and I, I can't but agree with, 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 with the three speakers, um, I've done lots of advocacy. You do need to be angry. You do need to be passionate. You do need to understand that um, all the state is out of mind with, with politicians and with civil servants and with the agencies. And, you know, you don't have to look too far. Um, in, in relation to drugs, I, I, I think I still can't get this. And I've written, I've spoken, and I know Sharon would have been the same. It, it's very difficult for a young person who is self who is self medicating for the trauma that they have. I, you know, I don't know what all the time what that trauma is, but I do know that lots of young people use drugs to self-medicate. The issue becomes serious when they go and try and get treatment. And if you have a mental health issue, it's actually more difficult to get because they won't treat you if you do a diagnosis. Um, if you come off the drugs, um, yeah, we, we do some, and then we'll treat you. And the issue here is what comes first. Taking kids off of drugs when they're self-medicating is really hard to do because they're left there. Their demons are all back uh, and that leads to other places. And it's, it's really difficult and we don't, we don't um, fit the needs of the kids. A lot of the young people that are in my centre come for different reasons. Some of them are similar, but, but I said my centre, it's our centre. Um, but what, what I have found is, you know, when they see someone stand with them, respect them, try and understand where they're coming from, even if all the time you can't, and just be there for them. That's pure advocacy, but <laughs> pure advocacy doesn't always work. And it is kicking in doors. It is knocking heads together. It is getting it whatever way you can. And for, 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 for us in the center, I mean, we, we take it at two levels, right? We want our young people to be advocating for themselves. You have someone like Remus and we had Ryan and Cueve over the last couple of days, and they're amazing. They're, they're, they're amazing. They just need to have a voice. And one of the things that I, I, I think in relation to young people advocating for climate action um, <clears throat> is I find that unbelievable. I mean, when, when young people came to me and they said, Don, we're going on strike on Fridays and we're not going to be coming in. We're going to the, the city hall. No, I, I did say that I thought they were on strike every Friday anyway because I weren't doing much work. But that was okay. And, and, and I was quite, I, I was absolutely thrilled with that because that's education. That's young people educating. They're, they're there. <laughs> I'm not going to interfere. When there were marches, we closed the centre in support of our young people and they went marching. And we support them by marching with them. In relation to advocacy within the centre itself, <clears throat> we've been advocating for 20 years for alternative education. Um, they don't see it, and, and they don't see it because they don't want to see it. And you know, it's not important, and you're told it isn't. It isn't a major concern. Like there's a life centre Cork, but why isn't why why, why aren't the people in in uh, Donegal looking for life centre? Because there isn't one there. That's why they're not looking for it. They don't know about it. And I mean, I'm not talking about all, all alternative education here. And the idea that all alternative education is lesser has a huge impact on kids coming again from, from the north side. I live in a working class estate. I'm not moving. I'm happy to live there. I'm working class. That's where I've always been. That's where, you know, I die that way. Um, and some, sometimes if I fell out my door and put, put my hands out, I would touch some of the students that were coming to the centre. 
And for me, it is about, you know, un understanding that for some kids, the trauma in their life has led them to situations where they're self-medicating, where their behavior is off. In this country, how we deal with that though, is kind of, it's crazy. It, 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 there's no planning, no planning whatsoever. You take, you take housing. So they don't want to build social housing, they remove council housing, and they give it to vulture funds. People can't afford housing. They're not going to be able to afford what the vulture funds are, are doing. Like that isn't a, a huge tax on the brain to be able to, to see that. And then to go with that, which I find <laughs> makes me really angry. Councillors around this country get X amount of money every year to host travellers, to, to accommodate travellers, not to host them, but to accommodate. And every year, the majority of councils send that money back to the state because they're afraid of moving and they won't spend the money. Who suffers though? It's young traveller children, it's traveller families. And, and there's no big thing. And the government can wipe them aside. And then you come to mental health. And they acknowledge that, they acknowledge there's, there's mental health. And their only response to mental health is just talk. Fine. What do you do when the talking isn't enough? And you try and go on a CAMS waiting list. And I'm not blaming the people that work in CAMS far be from it, but we have to campaign then to reduce and, and increase the number of, of places in, in CAMS so young people can get the service they need. Like, they then expect young people with, with drugs to, to come off drugs. So, so the, the usual thing that drives me crazy is young person doesn't think they have a problem. Well, they don't have a problem because the self-medicating is keeping them from having to deal with the demons. And what do we do? We have no beds to deal with that. There's not enough beds to deal with the issue. So that's broken. Kids in care. And again, we need advocacy around that and we try to. Kids in care are in there for their own protection. How is it so many of them get criminalized and end up in detention? Someone explain that to me. Because kids in care are viewed as somehow being trouble. Kids come out of formal education. We run a leaving cert course here because at the initially we were doing junior cert. I couldn't get a young lad that academically was getting 12 honours level um, junior cert results, A's or B's. And I couldn't get that young person back into formal education because if they were out of formal education, they had to be trouble. No one asked this young person why he was there. It had nothing to do with it. And we don't do that joined up thinking. And we do have the money to spend, but we, we're not spending it in the right areas. So somewhere like youth detention, in Hopestown, some give them all the money to you know, some do it. And then we put all the kids that we have mental health services for, that we have drug treatment services for, that we have care placements for, and that are not in education, put them into detention. That is not solving our issues. And it's not fair on our young people. You muted yeah. yourself, Dan. And I'm angry. Sorry? Uh, and I, I think, you know, we've all been through this, and I totally admire the three people on this panel. Uh, and I totally admire the way they've gone about their advocacy. I have seen it. I've seen Sharon where, when, in, in, her past, in her past life. Uh, uh, and... Sharon hasn't changed anything from that. Still the same person, still willing to go out there for the weak and the vulnerable in society. Remember, and I'll finish on this. I, I remember, you know, we, 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 we have to put labels on, on, on kids, which are not good anyway, because, you know, there's no positive thing about any label that I've ever met. Uh, and I go in schools, they're the same, even on the best footballer. If he's the best footballer, it means he's not good for academics. That's, that's the way it is. So none of them are positive. Um, and we tend to see kids as the labels instead of the child standing in front of you. That's the issue. That's not the child. Deal with the child. We tend to deal with the issue, try to deal with the issues and make a mess of it. But I remember, I, I, it was on one of James's podcasts, um, 
I mean, mine, but, but it was on one of the podcasts. And, you know, we love live, but we love labeling communities. And Father Peter McFerry would know this as well. And we, we label communities as disadvantaged, as vulnerable. I, I'm living in what is called a disadvantaged area. And I ain't disadvantaged. And, and most of my neighbors would tell you they are not disadvantaged. And, and, you know, until they said that, none of us thought we were disadvantaged. They go in and ask and they'll tell you. What we are short of though, is state investment. Um, why can't we shift some college courses to the north side of the city? There is no hospital on the north side of the city. That's government decisions. You know, we're talking about building a new hospital. We close an open permit. There are three on the south side, but we close an open permit. Now that says something maybe about our politicians too. So yeah, Sharon is right. Be angry, be passionate, and get out there. Sorry for answering. <laughs> You're absolutely right, though, to be fair. It's not necessarily that people are disadvantaged, it's more that people are ignored. Um, uh, but now we have time for Q and A's, which is yay. Um, please keep do sending, please do keep rather, sending them in um, as we go. Uh, this one's directed towards Sharon. Um, do you have any good recommendations for books or articles on trauma and homelessness? I want to be more informed, but I don't know where to start. Um, so I think if you just start with, with um, somebody like um, uh, Basil van der Kolk or, or Gabin, Gabor Maté or um, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Something Administration in the States, they have um, a lot of documents about the relationship between trauma, mental health and addiction. And I'd also say if you want a really good resource, you should listen to the Two Norries podcast because um, they have people on who are... Um, experts by experience or experts by their um, profession or experts by their 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 work so you get a really good range there um, and actually um, the two Norris will have um, am I allowed to say who you have on next week oh yeah You're, they'll have Gabor Matty on next week so um, I'd start there that's where I would start I would start with the two Norris podcast <laughs> thank you very much um, this one is for everyone. Um, you've all described being driven by a healthy anger. How do you keep yourself energized when you don't see the change that you know should be happening? Can I go first? By taking a huge amount of satisfaction in the small change you do see happen. That's where I get it. Like it, if you if you focus on the macro, the big the big change, you're going to be depressed out of your head twenty four hours of the day. And if Dan and Rachel focused on education policy and housing policy and all that all the time, you'd actually run yourself into a wall. What you take value in is the young person that comes into the centre that's looking down on the floor, no confidence, and walks out of the centre four or five years later with his shoulders back and his chin up. That's, that's where you get it. And for me, I get it if I see somebody come in the door to our service in, in Cool Mind Addiction Services in Cork. Um, come in the door, destroyed from drugs, you know, we do a bit of work with them, um, they might go out to residential, to do a bit of aftercare, like myself, two or three years down the line, they're asking you to help them out with a CAO application, a SUSE application, you know, they're, that's what drives you, and you think, you know what, I can get caught up with the policy stuff, and all that is very important, but the core of what we do is individuals, you know, helping individuals and lives, um, so that's kind of what keeps me driving on. Yeah, I would uh, absolutely agree with that. I think you have to take the long-term view and you have to be comfortable and happy with short steps. <clears throat> In the 70s and 80s, we couldn't get people, we couldn't get any decision makers interested in children, homeless children on the streets. Now you would never see a homeless child on the street. This totally changed. The Child Care Act came in in 1991. That guarantees every child accommodation, suitable accommodation and care. So today we have a lot of homeless people. <clears throat> I would hope that in 20 years time or less, you know, we would look back at today and say, homeless people, how could you possibly have, a, <laughs> how could you possibly have tolerated that? So I think we need to take the long term view uh, and be comfortable with uh, achieving small, small changes in, in the direction of the long term view. Thank you. 
I, I would agree with all of that. I think I think one of the things here is that while, while looking at the long term and understanding is going to take a time to do it, believe me, I, I tried to go head first and headbutt it everything I could headbutt. It didn't work, right? And and that that was me. No, I suppose I'm given hope, huge hope, by the young people that come in. We have. And, and it's an honor, and I, it's a, Peter probably feels the same, and, and, and James feels the same. It's an honor and a privilege to journey with young people for, for, for a short term. We're, we're not there all the time, but we journey. And, and to see those, those young people grow is just amazing. And so, while I want things to change and I want alternative education to be seen as under the education system with formal education. We work with what we have, and what we have are fantastic young people who, who keep us buoyed all the time. And you do get setbacks, but you'll come back from it. Yeah, it's the same for me. I suppose I'm, James will tell you, I'm pretty much fueled by rage. It's what keeps me going every day. So, uh, some people have smoothies. I have a, a big old mug of rage and it keeps me going for the day. But um, what sustains me then when so that can be very, um, that can be very bad for you, actually. You know, being fueled by rage can be very bad for you. It can make you feel very tired. Um, and I think one of the things is that thing about having your tribe, you know, so uh, James there is a very grounded, sensible individual. So sometimes I'll ring him giving out about something and he, he calms me down. So having a good network around you is really important. But like what everybody else has said, the stuff that I do in public and the way in which I've used the position that I've had the privilege to get to now, um, that stuff uh, generally is quite frustrating. Um, you don't see kind of short term successes, it's the things that happen privately. So <clears throat> I don't work in the community anymore. I work in, in a university, so I'm not working um, out, you know, in, in front line anymore. But um, I do still have a lot of connections with people in the community. So it's those private things that you don't see in public moments with people where they share something with you. Um, or they ask for some guidance and you're able to open a door for them and nobody might even know about that. Um, you know, those things are the things that the, the small individual connections and relationships with people um, that help sustain the momentum to be able to, to fill, the, fill the mug of rage again the following morning. I always thought I always thought that anger. I said that oh, I'll die young because of the amount of because of how cross I get, and then I keep looking. Father Father Peter McFerry's around since eighteen ten, fighting the good fight. So I'm I I I I I think that if I keep going, I might be around for a long time too. <laughs> Thank you all. I know I'm not technically a panelist, but I might actually add into this slightly as well. I I know myself. I. As I said, I work in climate activism and stuff like that, and a, a good bit in queer activism. And a lot of the time, there's again that anger that not enough's being done, not enough is happening, and we have a deadline with this. There's not enough time to get stuff fixed. But like, what a couple of months back, we had a small strike made in the middle of the city, made entirely. We got people to send in along their their backyards and stuff where they would stand where the, what they would have brought with them we got them we managed to get people all over cork in from skibbereen to like to clan everywhere across cork and ballincollig and everything we had people with who were willing to help us organize and who were willing to help collect placards from around their their area and get them travel and travel all the way to cork with them or travel along the ways to get them to other people along the way to cork there were 20 people, 30, who are willing to help in that capacity and hundreds more who are willing to help in those areas, getting those placards there. And we had, a, we spent hours taping those placards to the ground as carefully as we could and chasing after them as they were flying off to the because of the wind. But 
each one of those was someone who cared and who, who, who had a thought on this and who spent their time making a really nice placard. A good few of them were really, really brilliantly creative. They're still in my shed. I really need to get them back to people, but I haven't gotten around to that. Um, like each, a couple of, I think a couple of marches last year, for example, we had five, six million people across the globe marching for climate at the same time in the same days across the like across the entire world we had people marching and who cared and while a lot of the policy isn't changing every single one of those people is someone who gives a damn as much as you do and i think that's just as important as the big steps um but yeah there's my two cents popping in <laughs> Um, another question here, actually, uh, to the three speakers. Education has played a role. Uh, <laughs> education has played an emancipatory role for many vulnerable and minority groups. However, it's also failed those said groups as well. What three things would you improve or change in social services and education going forward for those most at risk? That's a mouthful. <laughs> right. I can go on the education one. We have a very good education system in Ireland. Uh, unfortunately, it's not good for everybody, but, the, you know, and we technically actually don't need, we technically have sufficient amount of resources already in education to be able to meet the needs of everybody. It's just how it's delivered. And in terms of how I change education is there is no uh, training. When you're doing teacher training, there is no training given on uh, psychological well-being on what is what is normal adolescent develop never mind the development never mind what can happen when when a, a young person is experiencing challenges and um, one of the other things is we do not have enough diversity in education and um, <clears throat> I don't know if there if there are any teachers who are travelers um, I don't know if there are any teachers who are from other ethnic minority groups. There are very few teachers who are from working class backgrounds. If you can't see it, you can't be it. And um, so for for lots of children, when they go into school in the morning time, it would be really nice if the teachers that were teaching them were from their tribe. Um, and it would also be really nice if the teachers who are there who have had the luxury of experiencing privilege in their lifetime if they were able to be given the the tools and the knowledge to understand what it's like to walk in the shoes of of a child who's who's facing challenges yeah, if i could come in as well i feel very angry about the educational system as uh, the second level educational system i think it needs radical reform it's been hijacked by third level education and used as a mechanism for selecting those who will go on to third level. It's extremely academic and it is depends on rote learning. It disadvantages uh, young people from a working class area because they're often more inclined to uh, to, to, to work with their hands. I think the expansion of the apprenticeship scheme has, is, is terrific. Uh, and really, and we need to put apprenticeship uh, on the same value scale as, as going to college. Uh, so I think we do need a, a very radical re-evaluation of the whole second level uh, educational system in Ireland. <clears throat> I was muted there, but I come in as well. Around the education, like I agree with what Peter was saying there, you know, like it, it shouldn't be all about academic. And, you know, I, I think what, what, what could be done there is giving apprentices the same status as a student, you know. Like when apprentices are going through their apprenticeship, they don't have student discounts. They don't have these little perks that a student would have, which is, they should be as valued, you know. In my area, those who are doing really well, they're all tradesmen and a tradesman will earn far more money than I will ever earn. Do you know what I mean? Do you know, um, the only, like I went down the academic route just because I had met my wife around that time. I was looking for a bit of direction and she had been down that route. It was just by luck. I was looking at apprentices myself, do you know, um, I was very lucky to be get, to get two scholarships while in UC, in UCC because I couldn't afford education and the Susie system is set up as well. It's set up in a way that it makes it so hard for you 
that it, unless you're, you have the resilience or the support behind you, it's very easy to drop out of the application process alone, you know. And I went through UC, or C, uh, Susie um, because I had lived in my parents' home for one of the previous five years and wasn't eligible for Susie. No, I was only, I was living in a house belonging to the Simon at this stage, you know, and I wasn't eligible for Susie. And did I get to speak with anybody about that? I got to speak with somebody in a call centre down in Mahon Point that couldn't answer any of the questions. It's just so frustrating. The system is set up for traditional, traditional learners, and I'm a non-traditional learner. I learned that as well. I'm non-traditional. But the system is set up nice and simple for 17-year-olds that have done the leaving sort and they go straight into college. That's what Susie set up for. For somebody like me, um, it wasn't. And it was only with the help of some charities in Cork, whom I won't name, because they'll get flooded with uh, applications for student uh, funds, you know what I mean? But it was uh, only with the help that I was able to get through the bachelor's degree. Every year, you bachelor's degree is hard. You're all, you have all this um, because you're a non-traditional learner and you're in UCC and, you know, it's all new ground for you. You have the imposter syndrome. Then you have... Uh, UCC fees office threatening to cut you from the library if you don't have your fees paid at a certain <clears> date and then you're trying to link with charities you're trying to fundraise it um, and I knew I wanted to do a master's but I knew I wasn't going to be able to afford it so it was just about getting the best grade I could to put myself in a position where I could apply for a scholarship and it was the same in the master's I, I got the scholarship did the best master's I could and got the scholarship for the PhD but there's loads of people that would have loved to have done a master's, you know, and would love to continue their education, but they can't because they're priced out of it. Because unless you're an elite student or you have an elite salary, you may forget about it. And Sharon taught me as well about the cost of people trying to become a psychologist. You know, I know it's very competitive to get selected in the course. And then the cost is unbelievable. You know, so um, there's a limited amount of courses. And even outside of that, like what I spoke earlier, even if you had all the Susie in the world and you had all the scholarships and all the money in the world, for you to want to go down and do um, go to UCC or Trinity when nobody in your family has ever done it, nobody <clears throat> in your estate has ever done it, um, it doesn't matter if you've all the resources, it's just going to be a deviant thing to do. And it's, that, that's where I think the likes of a mentoring program is helpful. You know, Dan was talking there a while ago about no colleges, like up in the north side, like, we, you, if you're in city centre or anywhere near the city centre and the south side, you'll see UCC's logo nearly everywhere. You know, they, they own so much property and MTU. Um, we don't see any of that iconography in the north side. People don't, it's not, they, don't they don't see it, they can't feel it. It's not tangible. It's something, UCC is something abstract that you'll never get there because it's for the rich people or the posh kids is what, what we believe, you know, and that's a big problem, you know, and with, even though we have Susie and we have backed education and all these things, we're still well underrepresented in third level, you know, so it's a big, big, it's a big problem. Uh, just, just two points by me. Um, the education system is failing lots. The government say it's 10%, right? And they're happy at 10%, but, but if we look at what 10% means, in the last CSO uh, figures, 900,000 young people were in education from primary to, to secondary. 10% of that is 90,000 young people are going to end up termed with this horrible term as an early school leaver. It is a major, major issue. And, and something needs to be done on that to address that. You know, if you want to look at it now, since the, the, the schools have opened up after the pandemic, 4,500 children have not returned. Where are they? There is going to be massive problems there. And, 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 and the second point I, I want to make in that is, is that even apprenticeships, even apprenticeships, the minimum requirement for apprenticeship is the junior cert. The last two years, they removed the junior cert. Now, in an argument with the department and with other people, they said, hold on, what happens to, you know, to the kids that that exam is their only state exam. It's the only one they're going to take. And they said, oh, it, it'll be accepted. But I said, unless the department is stating it, it won't. So last year, I had one student who left us at get a job at junior sir. All the rest went on. But I know schools around the country had lots. 
we got that note or that letter after recreating Havoc um, two Fridays ago. We're at the end of a year. This young person, if young people, if a father, an uncle, anyone wanted to take, and that's it, that's not an untraditional route into trades. Lots of young people have followed that route. But if you haven't your junior cert, <clears throat> you cannot, cannot go forward to it. And the fear is what they've done on, 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 um, on trades is they've moved it to CIT. You know, you, you go and you now go to third level to become a plumber, a, a, a carpenter, a tradesman of any sort, you know. That's cutting kids off. That's making them say, no, you, 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 not only do you have to do the junior cert, not only do you have to go and do the leaving cert, but you don't have to get into CIT. That's not the way I know most people who are in trades want to be. If they were that academic, they probably wouldn't want to do a trade. G give them the opportunity. Do not, do not remove the junior cert as the minimum requirement. It gives young people an opportunity for a good life. If you take it away, you're putting them into a position of depending on the state for the rest of their lives. I might also pop in and give my two cents here. Um, <laughs> like, I remember, um, as Sharon was saying, um, a lot of kids of color, for example, wouldn't have teachers who are the same race as them even. Um, I remember at the Black Lives Matter marches last, was it June or July, I can't remember which, um, but there was a woman speaking. Um, she said herself that she'd been here since 2003, which is the same amount of time I've lived in this country. Um, and she was a teacher. And for, I think, most of that, she was the only black teacher in the entirety of Ireland. Um, and only recently there's, I think she said five. I'm not entirely sure on that number, though, but that less than 10 teachers who are black. Um, I know the primary school I went to, um, my mom teaches there, so um, I I know there's one teacher of colour and she is brand new. They didn't have her five years beforehand. They didn't have her when I was going to school. So even in, and that, that school is quite big, it's um, 400 students roughly, um, which is a big enough school to have 400 students every eight years going through, not have a teacher of colour kids of color in those classes don't have a teacher who looks like them, who understands their issues, who understands their problems. There's, and that, that issue is clearly something that pertains around the entire country. There's educational, which like in many levels means that the issues that children of color will be facing at home that will, they'll be facing throughout the classes, minor remarks that a white teacher wouldn't pick up on that wouldn't be seen as an issue by a white teacher in books or by other students in the class aren't picked up on but by anyone but the child who's experiencing them and who is constantly living with the experiences that make their ears prick up to the slightest incidents that wouldn't be even noticed by a white person. There's the same, the same issue arises with queer children and disabled children and the like. Um, and as well, um, you were saying about um, teachers' education. Um, I have a small amount of knowledge on that because, as I said, my mom is a teacher. Um, I know she didn't get training in disability things and stuff like that. She got training later on, but that was her own choice in dyslexia and now autism because I have autism. So she just picked up and she was like, ah, yes, I shall learn about this, as you do. Um, but I know very few other teachers in her school that she's come across, that I've come across would have that training because it's not offered as base training. You have to go out and do a training week. You have to do a course on that to get any of that information. And for a lot of disabled kids, there's this thing of why didn't the teachers pick up on it? Why didn't anyone say, didn't anyone give us resources on this? I didn't get diagnosed until I was 14 and two months ago for ADHD because no one could pick up on it because no one had the words for it. None of the teachers have been introduced to those words. None of those teachers have been introduced to those concepts as anything beyond something that you come across every once in a while. They hadn't been taught how to pick up on those issues. And that results in people like me going through their entire lives being given out to for forgetting something or not being able to stop moving or 
not being able to stay still or getting things or mucking up socially, going through their entire lives thinking there's something wrong with me until you get to secondary level or to adulthood and you've realized, oh, there's a word for this. And many, many minority groups would have something similar happen throughout because you don't realize there's a word for something until you reach teenagerhood and you're exposed to it on social media or you're exposed to it through your friends who have worked it out or adults who have worked it out. And I think, I, I suppose, education for teachers should be something that's given more and improved a lot more in terms of how to deal with minority students because we're already attacked from all sides by a million and one little things constantly. And that should be improved in terms of teachers and supports that are supposed to be there that every other student theoretically should have, that every student theoretically needs, and not even theoretically needs, theoretically should have, but does definitely need, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but yeah, sorry again for putting in a lot. Um, another question, I think. Um, does the Irish prison system truly provide and support rehabilitation? How would you change the prison system if you had the opportunity? <sighs> Half the people, 90% of the people that are in there shouldn't be in there. That's what I think. You know, I think there's a, an overuse of prison system to house people that are homeless and house people that are in addiction in lieu of alternatives. And I have some sympathy for some judges because I've seen cases where the judge has no option but to put somebody in prison in lieu of other services, like Dan was talking about earlier on, if people have mental health issues and addiction issues, psychiatric care doesn't look, won't look after them, um, treatment, addiction treatment centres won't take them, and it's the chicken, the chicken and the egg, uh, where do they go? And my time working in homeless services, like the two lads, you'll see people coming in from prison, looking great, they might, they might do well in prison, they'd be the rest by it, as I was saying earlier on, but when they get out, all they have is the, is the hostel and the cycle of addiction, violence and all that. It's back into prison and it's very disheartening. You know, it's, prison is used and homeless hostels, they're used to house the people that the rest of society doesn't want. You know, so to be fair to the prison service, I have some contact with the prison service over the last few years. I know that they do implement some very progressive stuff in relation to our cousins across the water in America and England, we can be thankful we're not there, you know, um, but we still have a lot to do. And the fact that they're open to having the podcast in the prison, they're open to have, I, I train, um, recruit prison officers. So by the time they actually go on the landings, they have a good critical awareness around some of the issues that these people face. And they are recruiting people of social care background, youth work, community work, they're the type of people that they're looking to, to work in the prison. So they're looking at the prison as something more akin to a social care environment as opposed to an American supermax. So I think some credit has to be given. But the, the problem is a wider societal, you know, and the, the prison system can only deal with the people that get sent to the prison. The, 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 the systems in place that lead to that are what needs to be um, examined, really. Yeah, I agree completely with James. Uh, it's not the prisoner who needs rehabilitation, it's society that needs rehabilitation. As he says, 75% of all prisoners have an addiction. They shouldn't be there. They're there because they couldn't get treatment, most of them. Uh, <clears throat> huge mental health problems in prison, they shouldn't be there. Homeless people are automatically remanded in custody if they have no address, and they will serve their sentence to the last day because they have no address to be released early to. <clears throat> So it's society that needs rehabilitation. And the rehabilitation of prisoners depends not on what happens in prison. The rehabilitation of prisoners depends on what happens in the first six weeks after they come out of prison. And if they come out back into the same uh, dysfunctional family, dysfunctional community, addiction, if they come back into the same circumstances who, from which they went into prison, of course, they're going to relapse and become uh, and, 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 and repeat, become repeat offenders. <clears throat> yeah, I've uh, there's nothing else I can add to that. I mean, like, um, I suppose just to give you an example, we, you know, the, the, and, and Pete and James have spoken about that. Um, 
you know, about the amount of people in, in prison who were there for the wrong reasons. And we had a look at kind of the levels of trauma that existed within an adult homeless um, population in Cork City. And then last year, we looked at the levels of traumatic experiences in young people who were involved in, in juvenile justice systems. And what's really scary is that young people under the age of 18 who were involved in juvenile justice systems had the same type of trauma profile as somebody who was an adult experiencing homelessness and um, significantly more than the general population. So, 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 the, so the majority, there are, there are very few bad people. You have people who are really sad and you have people who are really mad and that's because society has let them down and uh, we criminalize their distress and it starts during their adolescence. So a young person who uses drugs because they are emotionally distressed and then they get arrested and they <clears> start going <throat> through a criminal justice process. And that is not a healthy, helpful approach to a child's distress. Um, I'm very disappointed by um, some of the people who are making decisions and some of the people who are influencing decisions in relation to, to the criminalization of young people. Um, it's again back to that lack of diversity within people who make decisions. So not being able to understand somebody else's perspective and then making decisions that ha that will have an impact. Like if you take psychology, for example, it, it would be very, very difficult to get a job as a psychologist if you've got a criminal record. Um, because you will be working with what would be considered marginalized, excluded groups. People would say vulnerable. I don't like that word myself. So if you're a young person, you know, and, and I've had students who, who've had criminal records and the, the barriers that they have to jump through when in fact what they have to offer to psychology, you couldn't buy it, you couldn't pay for it, what they have to offer. And like, you know, James has spoken about this before in the past as well, about the barriers that were put in his way because of his, his, um, his, his, his experiences. And like, you know, <clears throat> they're still there, that James still experiences those barriers and has to fight. Like, I just want to give you an example. If I'm asked to go on a board of management, so this is a board of management in the Cork Life Centre. If Don rang me in the morning and said, will you come on the board of, or board of management to Cork Life Centre? I can. It's absolutely no problem. If Don rang somebody who has a criminal record and said, do you want to come on the, the board of management? They have to go to court to get permission to go on the, the board um, because they have a criminal record. So, so unless we stop punishing and penalizing people who've had poverty, mental health, addiction, and then we actually put, we have to stop punishing them then for the rest of their lives as well. And, so and, and, and on that point, Sharon, I'm on the, I was asked to go on the board of directors in Cork Simon, which I'm over to know for the last 18 months, but technically I'm not on the board of directors. I'm just sitting in there observing because I'm not allowed to be on the board of directors because I have a criminal record. In the Charities Act, you're not allowed to have a criminal record unless um, unless you go through the High Court. So I'm waiting on a hearing with a High Court judge, which seems overkill, really. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you're being vetted and you can work in an organisation, why do you have to go to the High Court, do you know, for something like that? You know, it's just nonsensical, really. I might also, again, um, pop in with, I don't, I don't have any sort of proper training on stuff. Obviously I'm 18, um, but I do have like a small bit of research done. The five, the, what's called the five pillars of prison, like um, <coughs> criminal justice, that's the word. Um, retribution is one of them. Deterrence, uh, in incapacitation, uh, rehabilitate, re rehabilitation, um, and restoration. Personally, I think that the last two are the more important ones. Um, but uh, retribution, kind of a vibe of eye for an eye, um, is an incredibly, you know, I don't personally agree with that one. Um, there's incapacitation, which is to stop them from being able to do it again for now. Um, 
And then there's deterrence to stop other people from wanting to do the thing because, oh, you'll get to, you'll have to go to jail. Those three are the ones that are taken into most account in most countries. They're the ones that are most talked about, but those only have an impact in the prison and after the prison. They don't actually fix anything other than right now, you can't do anything. Right now, you're being punished. And well, beforehand, theoretically, you're, you don't want to go there. And to have that deterrence that you don't want to go there, it has to be a bad place. The last two pillars are, in my opinion, a far more important one of rehabilitation and restoration. Rehabilitation being giving them an alternative, giving them a, a different route. There's some countries um, in, uh, I think Norway is one of them, where you get training in a course. If you're in a prison for long enough, you get training in a course, generally in a trade, so that when you get out of prison, you have something to do with your life and you have some sort of education, particularly for those who have been in and out of prison from a young age, um, because it's generally, once you're in prison, it's very hard to get out and get something done and get out of that cycle because A, prison, you're safe, you have food, you have somewhere to be, you have somewhere to sleep. Um, out of prison, a lot of the time people don't have that. Um, and then there's restoration, which is to fix the problems and fix what has happened and try and fix, for example, if you're in there for drugs, you restoration would be to get you out of the cycle of drug use so that when you get out, you're not going back to drugs because prison systems don't work without the last two. The first three, you can do all the deterrence, you can make it as hellish as you want, but that's not gonna stop people from ending up in prison. That's not gonna stop people from being in those cycles unless you have the last two, which are in my opinion, the most important, but the most ignored ones of prison system. Sorry. They'd, they'd love you over in UCC criminology. I, I, it's interesting, but also I like, I would cry <laughs> constantly. Oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, next question, yay. Uh, why do you think governments do not listen to people like yourselves? You all have a proven record in your fields and yet are constantly ignored. Truth. Well, I think a large part of it is they don't have the same experience. They don't have the hands-on experience of the suffering and uh, problems that uh, disadvantaged people who are homeless or people who are poor or people uh, or other people have, they, they have a theoretical knowledge uh, of, of those problems maybe, but they don't have the passion. In order to change things, you need the passion. And they don't have the passion because they don't have that experience. Uh, I think that's, uh, there are all, for anything you propose, there are always reasons why you can't do it, why you shouldn't do it. And they are at the forefront of, of decision makers' minds. I think that there's a, you know, you hear this thing that um, if you get up early in the morning and you go out and work hard, that you can have whatever you want. Um, and for many people, that's true. Um, and particularly people who tend to be in positions of power and in government, that if they get up early in the morning and they go out and they work hard, they can have whatever they want. Um, so then, you know, when you look at somebody who's living in social housing, uh, uh, like I, I grew up in social housing, you look at, you look over there then and you say, well, why haven't they got the nice car and why haven't they got the nice holiday and why haven't they got this nice job in, in public service or whatever it is? And, and you, you think, you know, it's easy. You, you just go out and you work hard and you get whatever you want. Um, and I don't think that they really understand the privileges that they have that allowed them to be able to get the things that they want. And, and, you know, James mentioned that about the social capital. So, you know, very simple things like if you're 14, if you're, you know, for example, if you're 16 or 17 and you say, um, well, one of the things I'd like to do when I'm, you know, and I, you know, I'd like to work as a, I'd like to work in a vet. I'd like to be a vet. Um, if, if you're living in a, in a particular, and like James said, you know, where I lived as well, I grew up in a council estate, there were no vets, I can tell you living in the council estate. So, so if you're living in, in a different area uh, and in a different income stream, um, your neighbour might be a vet and then the neighbour down beside them might be something else. So it, it starts quite young in terms of your access 
to, to different spaces and places. Um, so, you know, if you're if you're you're living in an affluent area, um, there's going to be someone in a sale shirt, John, Mr. Whoever living in number 10, he's vet. We run down there and ask him, can you can you get a summer job there? Um, there's no summer job. There's very few. There's no one. There's no summer jobs up the north side, really, James, is there? Um, you know, so uh, the only thing you can do up the north side in the summertime is drive cars around the fields that you've stolen. <laughs> um, so so it's 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 those very early experiences. So so there's people who have privileges who couldn't possibly even begin to understand those privileges because many of those privileges are actually quite subtle. And they think that everybody else has those privileges or those access. So you'll hear people saying, oh, you know, don't build social housing because social housing is free housing. Why should they get free houses when I've had to work for this house? And the reality is, is that social housing isn't free. Number one, I can tell you because I lived in one. We had to pay rent for it. The other thing is as well, is if you take that concept of social housing as free housing. So I'm very lucky. I have a really nice job. I work in UCC. I can afford to pay X amount of rent. Um, I have worked as a cleaner. I have worked as a dental nurse. I have had very low income jobs uh, ever before I went to university. Um, so I, if I had not benefited from social mobility, I would need I would need to avail of social housing. So if you want to say um, I don't want to build so, social housing, it means that you you haven't thought about the people who clean your office. You haven't thought about the person who gives you your your chai latte on your way to work in the morning. These are all people who actually do work really hard as well, um, but they they don't have the income that will allow them to be able to access the kind of housing that you will get if you're a higher income earner. And and unless you have, as, as Peter McFerry has said there, unless you've actually walked that path, I don't think you can possibly imagine the different barriers that you experience. You can only look at it from your own lens. So we need more and more people from different backgrounds and situations to benefit from social mobility so that they can get into positions where they can have a bigger influence. So the, so, so we need more and more people um, getting into, into, I want more people from different backgrounds getting third level qualifications so that they can get into those jobs that make differences and then for the people who who don't want to go down that road to be able to find their tribe and to be able to do ad advocacy in in a, in a different way because we need both actually and I, I let go of what the two lads are saying tom's what peter was talking about those who make the decisions and implement the policies they don't have the experiences of us or the passions that we have um and like i'll bring it back to the to the drug policy because that's where i was interested in my own research the, f the working group that we had, beautiful piece of research. Um, they recommended decriminalization. They recommended a lot of things, but they recommended decriminalization. The government took that, right, and they implemented it, but only for the first two offenses. So if you're in a, cr a chronic addiction and you're on homelessness and you get arrested twice in one day for drug possession, is that person in homelessness going to then sit around and say, you know what, I'm going to stop using drugs now? Because if I if I don't stop using drugs, I'm going to end up in court, and I can't have that. No, that will never, ever, ever come into the conversation. But what conversation? Who does that benefit? It benefits a middle class student that gets caught with a bit of weed on Rag Week. It benefits a, a student that gets caught with a couple of ecstasy on Freshers Week. They'll avoid the conviction because they have all this potential. But for those that are in chronic addiction on the street status quo they're criminals and sure we they're written off anyway they're not going to become anything anyway so you might as well just give them the conviction but it's a good policy we'll keep it for those young people that we can relate with that's you know it might help my son or my grandson or niece or nephew and then terms of what sham was talking about they have this lovely term that they like to dismiss us uh, as something i learned and i think is meritocracy they always spoke the idea that it's a meritocratic society. We live in a meritocracy. IQ plus effort equals success. If you work hard enough and you're smart enough, you will succeed. And those are, um, those in the political parties, like, I don't even want to name them, but we know who they are. They, they, they come from that standpoint because they have all the resources in the world. And it, it goes back to that free area thing as well. It's not that they're scheming behind our backs they're just ignorant to their own prejudices and we have to be careful 
that the oppressor or the oppressed doesn't become the oppressor. Because to be honest with you, they have no awareness around it. You know, they just don't understand. And it's up to us as advocates to keep fighting the fight and challenge people when they say, oh, it's a, mer- it's a meritocracy. We live in a meritocracy. IQ plus effort equals success. Smart enough, work hard enough, you'll succeed. But we don't all start at the same start line, you know. And just because, you know, um, Leo Vradker starts here, somebody in Nakahini is starting down by your ankle, you know. But we're going to, it doesn't matter how hard he uh, tries or how smart he is. Maybe all his effort and intelligence is going <clears> to make sure he survives, you know, to 18 years of age, you know. Maybe the, all the mother's intelligence and effort goes into making sure the kids have food on the table. You know, they don't have the privilege or the um, luxury of going into politics or you know, doing. And it's another issue as well in terms of the education is we exclude part time learners from Susie Grants, you know. And what if somebody does, uh, what if there is a single parent or working parents and they're they want to try social mobility. They want to maybe move up in the world. They want to, you know what? The kids now are a little bit old. Maybe I could go to education, but you, you're not funded for, uh, you can't expect somebody to give up their kids, give up their job and go off to UCC for five days of the week. That excludes so many, as I said, or on non-traditional learners. You know? And I think that we have to you know, improve access to education by funding um, and helping people do part-time courses. Might also um, just, um, just, just could I just maybe come in? I think, I think we left something out here, you know. Um, lots of the areas in which we work in, uh, and where where I live in, and James lives in, um, see no benefit, and had seen for years no benefit. And I know Peter McVerry would be the same. I mean, you talk about the flats in the inner city of Dublin, uh, and you talk about the movements there. They didn't vote because they didn't feel part of the process. They, they, they felt they got nothing out of the process, so why vote? And that then allowed people to be ignored. Um, there was no kick up. You, you hadn't a TD elected, and, and it is. And so for me, you know, sometimes when I hear people saying that, I say, right, I, I get what you're saying. I do get it. The, the area has been left. Go to Rack and Rune, and there are massive areas in Dublin when you move out, uh, Tala and the newer estates, where very few resources have been put in. And people in there then look at it, you just look at the data, it comes out after every election, and you see that the largest number of, of people that there's lowest turnouts are in large working class, don't like the terms disadvantaged, but in those areas, they buy out from that. And what we need to do as advocates as well is to say, you know, I, I, I'm not telling him to vote for a political party, but I'm saying vote for someone from your area. I mean, it, it was very, you know, I looked at North Central here for, for, for years, <laughs> and there was one stage there were five TVs in the Cork North Central. Two of them lived in the area, <laughs> and they lived in the area because they were living in Sunday as well, and they were living in Bishopstone. And we had no one that actually lived in the area. And I think for me, you know, that that is one thing that needs to be tackled. I I believe we have to say it, people need to vote because decision makers will make decisions on holding their seat. Sorry, that's what they make decisions on. You know, uh, backbenchers will get up in arms if we start saying um, we're, we're going to get, you know, when presidents come out, we're going to give them five years, you're going to get two years, wipe the record. There will be absolute murder in, in areas like that. But, but in areas that are affected by that, it gives people a chance. And the only way you get to that is by making it count. And, and voting is one way, it's not the only way. You still have to advocate, you still have to be on the ground, and you still have to work in these areas. Um, and and that's that's one of the big things for me that they, 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 they won't listen to, they won't, they will listen to you. Um, I, I often say this, you know, people are great at hearing the noise children make. They don't often listen to children. And, and that's what kind of happens with adults from those areas. They're not voting. We don't have to worry about them. They're not going to cause any upsets. And, and I think on, on, until we get that going, you're going to have that. Again, you know, you look at 
you were talking about iconography around about UCCN. The hospitals were taken, there's three on the south side, older. Why did the north side one go? Because the big hitting politicians were on the south side. I'll give you a very simple example of it. The Mary Elms Bridge, I have great time for Mary Elms, but Mary Elms was on the Black Rock Road, and that's where Mary Elms came from. Mother Jones, a trade unionist, lived in Shandon. The bridge takes you from Shandon across the river. But a lot of people don't know, 31 seats on Cork City Council. The majority, 16 of the seats are in the south side of the city. Now, who do councillors vote for? You know, we, we, we need to look at that. And it, it, James is right, and you know, the other setups then, the other thing for me is there was something I learned very quickly when I got into this line of work. Uh, the first junior class I ever took to a junior cert, and I, and I wasn't here. And I, 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 I met the parents, and the parents absolutely bawling crying. The first child from their family to have achieved a state examination. And for a lot of people, that continues to be the case. It tells you all you want to know about how intergenerationally we view education. And if it wasn't a success for you and you start, your child starts having problems in school, it isn't the view for them. And we need to, we need to kind of, we, we need to kind of look at that and get politicians to act on that. Otherwise we're in trouble. Sorry about that phone. Can I just jump in and say that that we have loads more questions and people are so engaged, but that had to be our last one. Um, and I know that Sharon is going to get locked into UCC if she doesn't get to say goodbye to us in, in the next few minutes. Um, she's going to get locked in her office overnight. Um, so I might just say thank you so much to all of the panellists. And I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions. There were so many. They listened to Remus as many reminders about questions. Um, I just want just to close quickly, which is the lovely job I got, the really easy one for the week, because I get to just sit here and listen and then close. Um, there was a comment rather than a question in from Oscar, which I really echo, that said, um, well done to you, Remus, on your moderating, so articulate and insightful. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Remus actually went from moderator and host to a panellist, which we couldn't actually be more thrilled about. That is amazing. Um, Sorry. No, that's a really good thing. I, I, I think that's absolutely amazing. Just to sum up what I jotted down on, on my page, what spoke to me throughout was, I suppose, the importance of stories, the importance of anger and rage and raising outrage. There was a lot of talk about naivety. Um, and I suppose that naivety being believing that if people are struggling or need support, that someone will jump in and help. And I suppose if Peter, Sharon, James and Remus are naive, then I'll be naive every day of the week, I suppose is what, is what I would say. Um, and I think Peter's opening story about the house and the different views from the garden really sums it up so beautiful. It's so relatable. And I suppose what we all know here that is, is that it doesn't matter where we come from or what our journey has been. We all deserve the view of the beautiful garden, which sounds very simple, but for us who are, 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 are working through it, we can become filled with rage, as, as Sharon said, and that can lead to despair. But I suppose my closing thought is that I do find lots of hope and energy in the fact that I live in an Ireland that has a Peter McFerry, has a Sharon Lambert, has a James Leonard, and indeed, even more importantly, perhaps, has Remus Tien and lots of other young people coming up behind them to lead the charge so I just want to thank everyone I think that's as good a note to close on as any thanks Rachel thank you so much thanks very much everybody thank you Sharon run <laughs> and well done Remus. really really appreciate it Sharon and James and, and Father Peter and, and just what I'd say is keep doing what you're doing later you too you too um, well, well done, well done, lads, and a great week of um, a great week of speakers, you know. And I, I know I'm going to get a lot of uh, people asking me, "Is this going to be available to access later on?" Um, so if it is, send it on to me, and I'll share it for you as well. That's, Actually, we will do that. Can I ask a small question myself? Um, where, where, where do you get the podcast? Is it on Spotify or? It's on Spotify yeah. if you prefer the audio, but if you like to watch it, it's on YouTube as well. YouTube. YouTube. Okay. 
Nice. Yeah. Uh, Sharon, we'll catch up and have a cup of coffee. The same with you, Jim.